You're listening to Searching for More, a podcast of the Diocese of Arlington. On this episode, Father Donald Fest, pastor of St. Joseph Catholic Church in Alexandria, Virginia, shares his devotion to St. Joseph and offers us lessons on humbly trusting God. It says that Joseph was a man of not words, but actions. Yeah. During this year of St. Joseph, hear Father Fest lay out practical things we can learn from St. Joseph and ways to invoke his character as we go through our day. This episode's host is Billy Atwell, Chief Communications Officer of the Catholic Diocese of Arlington. Father Fest, thank you so much for joining me on the podcast. Well, thank you for inviting me. So we're obviously going to talk about the year of St. Joseph and St. Joseph himself, but before we go there, if you would, um, so you're a part of a religious order called the the St. Joseph Society of the Sacred Heart, known as the Josephites, and you're the pastor, very appropriately, of St. Joseph's Parish. So if you would talk about both your order, what maybe drew you to that order, as well as your your parish, what it's like. All right, well, uh, what drew me to the order was St. Joseph himself. Uh, I had written in the uh, sixth grade to about 30 religious communities of priests. And the only one that had St. Joseph's in its name was the Josephites. And okay. So that was the uh, the arm that grabbed me. And then um, I knew that I was to be a missionary. I knew that I was to be not in Pittsburgh, which is my hometown, and but I was not to leave the United States. And so the Josephites fit into all that. We are a missionary community. Uh, We were founded in 1871. Pope Pius IX wanted missionaries to come to the United States to minister to the freed slaves. So Cardinal Vaughn, who was not a cardinal at the time, he had a group of men, now known as the Mill Hill Missionaries, who were ready uh, to be sent someplace. So Pius IX sent him to Baltimore to minister to the newly freed slaves, and that's how everything got started. They were told to take what's called the Negro Oath before they left England, which is that they would only serve the African-American community. Wow. Because at that time, everybody needed priests, the Germans, the Italians, the Irish. Everybody needed priests in the United States, so they knew, Rome knew that the bishops Uh, would try to pull them away (laughs) from this uh, important mission that he wanted them to do. So they took the Negro Oath, and in 1893, uh, the Josephites uh, broke off from the Mill Hill and stayed in the United States. The Mill Hills, uh, which is also St. Joseph's Society for Foreign Missions. Okay. Uh, They uh, went to other countries and places. The Josephites stayed in the United States, and because of the Negro Oath, uh, only serve in the African-American community. That's interesting. And uh, so uh, I was sent to St. Joseph's in Alexandria uh, about eight years ago. Uh, And uh, it's the first time being a pastor of St of a St. Joseph's Church. I was very honored for that. And uh, St. Joseph's was founded, it split off from St. Mary's in Mm -hmm, Alexandria uh, because of the Jim Crow laws, which uh, did not allow black people to associate with white people. Mm -hmm. So they were in the balcony, they had to go to communion last, all kinds of of, uh, discrimination. Uh, that was uh, taking place because of Jim Crow laws. So uh, they peti- uh, the black members of St. Mary's petitioned the Bishop of Richmond, which this was part of the Richmond Diocese. Right. And he gave them permission to form a parish, uh, but they had to uh, get the land, they had to build the church, they had to do it themselves. So they had many uh, bait sales and dances and what have you. But of course, they needed more money. Yeah, it takes and a lot of cookies to, you gotta sell a lot of cookies to build a parish. <laughs> that is correct, <laughs> a lot of dinners. Yeah. <laughs> so they, uh, they uh, involved uh, the Indian Negro Mission Collection, which gave money towards 
the effort and also, which is, by the way, the, sec- the oldest second collection in the United States. Yeah, those listening might not even know that it's still an ongoing collection that takes place every year. That is correct. That's wild. Interesting. So we benefited from that. And then they invoked uh, the help of uh, St. Catherine Drexel in Philadelphia. Oh, wow. And she and her sister and family members helped uh, in, um, in seeing that the property was purchased. We have her name on the deed wow. that she signed. And uh, also, uh, whenever St. Catherine would build a place, which she built many That's uh, right. th- throughout the South, she would always go back and visit. So we know that she came to St. Joseph's. So we know she walked up and down the aisle. She always checked on the work that she had invested in. So I were very fortunate to have her as a benefactor and as a uh, friend of the parish. So what is the makeup of the parish now? So obviously it was founded as a primarily you know, African-American parish. It remains that today? Or, or how does the demographic look now? Well, it's probably 50-50 because okay. the neighborhood it's, has changed. Oh, okay. Uh, the neighborhood... Uh, where there was public housing has Mm -hmm. been torn down and replaced with unaffordable housing for African-American people that traditionally lived in that part of Alexandria. Yeah. The other side of the tracks, if you will. Yeah. So uh, because of that, uh, many of the uh, local members of the parish had to move away. And whenever they tear down public housing, they give you vouchers and that yeah. usually takes you out of the vicinity. So most of our African-American members come from great distances, passing three or four That's Catholic right, yeah. churches to get to St. Joseph's. And needless to say, if you're willing to do all that, you're also a very, very active member of the parish. And it's quite supportive. Does that put a lot of pressure on you to deliver a good homily when you know they've driven from far away? <laughs> oh, yeah. And, and also, uh, you know, We emphasize to everybody, black or white or whoever, that comes that, you know, we are an Mm -hmm. African-American traditional parish, so we don't make excuses for that. The white community that comes are very uh, happy to be there and and, uh, enjoy the experience. You have a very, very joyful parish. It's a very good community there. Yes. You really do. And that's done by the people. Very good. Very cool. Well, thank you for that, that background, both on your order and the parish. Those are, those are both very interesting. So the, the, obviously the topic that we're getting into here is about St. Joseph. Pope Francis has called this the year of St. Joseph. And this is a special devotion, obviously, um, for you. You, you mentioned that even as a child you had a devotion uh, to St. Joseph. One of the most interesting things for me, at least, about St. Joseph is that he's not quoted in Scripture anywhere, which is a fascinating thing for him to be such a central figure, not just in salvation history, but in the, the Holy Family family themselves, Correct. for him to have not been quoted once. What does that say about who he was and, and how we should understand him and, and kind of pray to his intention? Well, I think what that tells us is that Joseph was a man of not words, but actions. Yeah, God spoke to him in dreams. We hear all that, what he's told to do. And he does it immediately. And uh, he does it to uh, uh, because he is a good and loyal and faithful Jew and a devotee of uh, of God, and so he does it. He listens. He trusts that God is directing him in the right way. Taking Mary as his wife, for instance, or following the instructions to uh, go to Egypt, which is uh, Saint Joseph is the patron of missionaries, mm-hmm. by the way, because he went into Egypt. He took the Christ child. Interesting. He was in Egypt, so he was. We consider him the first missionary to do so. Hmm. Another thing about Joseph is that he was picked by God. Mary was picked by God, and we have a big uh, section of the gospel that tells us about that. The That's Annunciation, right. but so was Joseph. Uh, if you think about it, uh, he God had to get someone that was going to take care of his son that he could entrust his son to take care of Mary. And uh, so Joseph was selected. Mm -hmm. And um, 
to do that job. Yeah. So he is the patron of families. He's the patron of uh, family life, of virgins. Uh, so yeah. we call him the pillar of families. Right, right. It, it, with Mary, it seems like she was, you know, through Scripture, she was, it was like her, she was foretold that there was going to be this woman who would bear this child. Was that there that same kind of foretelling of St. Joseph and his role, or, or was that, you know, for at least early Christians, maybe a, a surprise, so to speak? No. Uh, the Everything he got, he got in dreams. Yeah. So it's interesting. Uh, he was a good sleeper. <laughs> uh, well, he worked hard, so that, yeah. that explains it. So uh, God speaks to us any way he wishes. And uh, for Mary, it was an angel. For yeah. Joseph, it was in his dreams. So uh, That's wonderful. And when he woke up, he did what he felt God was asking him to do, and he did it. So he was yeah. not a man of, his, of, a, of the word. He was a man of action. Absolutely. And that's actually reflected in um, the litany of St. Joseph. So some of the, the ways that he's described, he's the foster father of the Son of God. He's chaste and just. He's prudent and brave, obedient and loyal, a model of workers and a pillar of family life. You know, so he goes on, he's the protector of the church. And these are all actions, obviously, of him. Um, talk to us a little bit about that role that he had as, as foster father of Jesus and, and what, that, what that means. Well, I think probably this is the most significant role he had as foster father, because we have many men today who foster uh, boys and girls that are not their own. Uh, They take care of them one way or another. They take an interest in the child who doesn't have a father, whose father has died or is a soldier, uh, even in prison, uh, and men will step into be the father figure for that person. It's very important. And I believe that uh, what they offer to the family, to that family or to that child, is uh, is something to help that person become all that they are called to be. Mm. That's wonderful. one of his most prominent titles is St. Joseph the Worker. So he was a carpenter. Obviously, he he brought Jesus up in that trade because we we know of him as a carpenter. Um, What does that reflect about his his character, but also his humility? Because I don't think that was a a trade that was picked by chance. I think that was something obviously given to him to communicate something for centuries and millennia beyond um, beyond his own life. But what should we learn about St. Joseph through his, his title of St. Joseph the Worker? Well, uh, one of the things is that uh, he knew that he had to provide for his family, and the trade that uh, we give to him as, as carpenter, and mm. that he would use this child entrusted to him, Jesus, to help in the carpenter's shop, to teach him the trade, uh, to lift heavy wood and mm-hmm. get it uh, shaped into what it had to be. And uh, so Joseph helped shape Jesus into a man, and he also helped uh, Jesus in the, uh, in, the, as, in the role as father. Yeah. So uh, that's what fathers do. They mentor their sons. They, they uh, help them along in their development. I think Joseph as patron of work and workers is important this in these days because there's so many men who uh, need work and can't find it. Mm-hmm. Able-bodied men, uh, especially during this pandemic. And uh, St. Joseph is a good patron to go to for work uh, and uh, to be able to take care of their families, to be able to put food on the table with, and pay the rent and do all these things that fathers do. And so he's a worthy man, uh, saint, to petition for on, on behalf of work mm-hmm. and then workers, especially yeah. during the pandemic. Yeah, absolutely. That, that's a good point. I didn't think of that angle, but that, that makes a lot of sense. So I mentioned a number of the attributes of him that we reflect on in the Litany of the Saints. For you personally, when, you, when you're praying for his intercession, what are some of the attributes of, of his that you find yourself most readily asking for? Well, uh, that I would have the same attitude as him mm-hmm. uh, in what I do. When I was asked to come on to this show, I didn't want to do it. <laughs> uh, Amber called me, and I, uh, I hesitated. Then I thought, well, St. Joseph 
has helped me all through my life, uh, all the way through, and that I owed this to him. And uh, so uh, I got that from him to, <laughs> to, to do what you're asked to do, especially on his behalf. So I'm paying back a favor, if you will. <laughs> well, we're grateful for it. <laughs> yeah, and I, I consider St. Joseph to be my friend. I consider St. Joseph to be my hero. So when I'm sent to assignments, uh, I believe, as he did, that I'm being sent to this, as he was told in a dream. I was told by a letter, go here, go there. Uh, so in any assignments that I have received, I asked St. Joseph to help me as and do the job as he did. Yeah. The other thing is uh, uh, when you're at the assignments, Josephites, that is, that many times you're in a poor parish. Uh, I was one in Baltimore, second largest concentration of public housing in the United States. So you have a lot of poor people. And, uh, you know, St. Joseph is someone that I would often refer people to for uh, uh, help when they needed it. Uh, and if they're looking for jobs or if they can't make ends meet or whatever it happens mm -hmm. to be that St. Joseph uh, is a worthy uh, patron and one who uh, who helps so um, yeah. uh, I always uh, would bring him into whatever it is counseling or encouragement yeah. to people I think of him a lot because as a dad you know our, my kids are little you know se uh, seven six and uh, four I, I have to do a lot of things I don't want to do and I think about St. Joseph you know and the fact that he, he, there's not even words of, of really like even praise for St. Joseph like in scripture like he, he just kind of humbly is in the background doing the work and Jesus while you know obviously divine um, still had a roof over his head, still ate, still had clothes and all those kinds of things. And it's because St. Joseph worked hard for the family. And I think, exactly. you know, anytime you have to do something you don't want to do, you're kind of modeling the life of St. Joseph. And that's not a bad person to model your life after, after all. That is true. Um, what, what are some ways that we can learn from him in a practical way? So as we kind of go through our day, how can we invoke his, you know, his character like we've talked about? Well, uh, there's, in the Old Testament, uh, when... Uh, the family of Joseph of the Old Testament was mm. starving to death. Uh, they were told to go to Joseph, not knowing that that was their their brother that they sold into slavery. Uh, and so uh, the thing to do, my advice, is go to Joseph. Go to Joseph for whatever it is. Mm. They went to there because there was a famine, and we go there to him uh, because that's who God went to. Mm. to choose a foster father for his child. And this is the one that protected Mary. Uh, this is the one that provided for that family. And so Joseph, I believe, is the normal, or natural, I should say, person to go to. I think also in this day and age with the uh, migrants and the uh, yeah. refugees, especially at our borders, that Joseph is one who uh, couldn't find a home for Mary and Joseph, to, for Mary to have the child Jesus in Bethlehem. Joseph was the one that had to take uh, Jesus and Mary as refugees, uh, aliens, if you will, into Egypt to ex escape Herod. So Joseph is also very much a part of anyone who is uh, being alienated or yeah. uh, who can't find a stability, a home. Uh, Joseph is the one to go to, mm -hmm. the natural yeah. uh, one to go. Yeah. Um, so this year, so I mentioned this is the year of St. Joseph. So from December 8th, 2020 to December 8th of 2021, we're in this year of St. Joseph. Why do you think Pope Francis picked now to be the time for this year of St. Joseph? Obviously, any, any year is a good year for St. Joseph, but why this year, do you think? Well, we know, first of all, it was because 100 years ago, uh, the Pope back then uh, put the church under the patronage of St. Joseph because he protected uh, Jesus and Mary, 
Mary be in the, uh, the ark that carried Christ to us in our womb. So uh, Joseph is the protector of the Christ child. He's the protector of uh, the body of Christ, which is the church itself. So 100 years ago, that was done. And I believe by calling this the year of Joseph, which, by the way, the Josephites had requested this for years and years. Really? Oh, interesting. So did our holy founder, uh, Cardinal Vaughn, uh, uh, ask uh, the Pope to uh, have a year of Joseph. So anyhow, uh, it finally came. Uh, the church was put under his patronage and now in protection. Uh, and now uh, we are celebrating this year, I say it's taking Joseph out of the closet and giving him to the whole church to look at as maybe this figure yeah. who often stood in the background but did so much is now someone to be uh, invoked, emulated, and model our Christianity after. Yeah. How to respond to God, how to serve God, how to love God, and Mary. Yeah, that's interesting. That's very interesting. Um, for someone who's listening that, that, you know, obviously they can't go read the prolific words of St. Joseph. And so, so if they have a, feel like they may have a devotion or they want to kind of explore, you know, a, a Josephite spirituality more, what would you recommend them? Like, where's a good starting point to have a better devotion to St. Joseph? Well, I would say if you're uh, in the Diocese of Arlington, go to the website. Yeah, <laughs> there's a section there on, on the year of St. Joseph yep. with a lot of materials telling us what are the uh, indulgences that yep. one can gain by invoking him. Uh, so that's the first place to start. If you want to learn more about the Josephites, we have a website as well, uh, josephite.com. And uh, we have a section on St. Joseph there. And also, if anyone wishes to join our community, how to go about that. Mm -hmm. uh, how to be a son of St. Joseph, if you will. Very good. So uh, that Arlington Diocese, it's arlingtondiocese.org slash year of St. Joseph, and that's S.T. Joseph. So arlingtondiocese.org slash year of S.T. Joseph. So uh, Father Fuss, I think you have a prayer that we maybe you could close us out with if well, you would. It's not a prayer. It's something that Pope Francis said, and he's, he's talking about... Uh, uh, St. Joseph as the special patron of all those forced to leave their native lands because of war, hatred, persecution, and poverty. Uh, he says, as the guardian of Jesus and Mary, Joseph cannot be other than the guardian of the church, of her motherhood, and of the body of Christ. Consequently, every poor, needy, suffering or dying person, every stranger, every prisoner, every infirm person is the child whom Joseph continues to protect. And those are the words of Pope Francis. That's a very fitting end. Father Fest, pastor of St. Joseph's Parish, proud pastor of St. Joseph's Parish, thank you so much for, uh, for joining me. Well, thank you. You're listening to Searching for More. If you enjoyed this podcast, please write a review on iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, Spotify, or wherever you listen. Also, make sure you follow the Diocese and the Arlington Catholic Herald on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And subscribe to our YouTube channels for regular videos that inspire, educate, and inform about the Catholic faith in our diocesan community.